starting again, <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all <coughs> to Dr. Harry Tuttle, who will be talking to us about about um, modern language proficiency through the <laughs> Thank you. statements. <laughs> Modern language proficiency through can do statements. And I'd like to also thank our sponsors and supporters, particularly Steve Hargadon and Blackboard Collaborate, and the wonderful team at the Australia E Series who have organised this for us. Uh, and now, if you would like to pick up um, one of these little smiley faces or world maps and place it on the map to show us where you're coming from. <laughs> Big smiley face there from Sarah. Okay, um, I'll hand it right over to you now, Dr. Harry. Well, thank you ever so much. I'd like today to talk about increasing world language proficiency through the NSSS, LA, Apple, can do statements, and I'll go over all those big initials in just a second. Um, but I think what's intriguing is that right now, at least in the United States, we have no objective measure for student speaking. When students speak in the classroom, we really don't have anything to measure that against. We make up our local tests, or we even have had in the past some state tests, but they don't really, other than being a state test, they don't, they're not held to any high measure. And so we've got that one thing going on. And the other thing we have going on is that much of the speaking that's being done in language classrooms, for example, is not realistic speaking. And an example of that is in my textbook, I teach at the college level now, we have five chapters. And in the last chapter, the student can finally ask, how much does it cost, and talk about food. Now, can you imagine a person going to, for example, in my case, Spain, and waiting January, February, March, April, and May before they can say how much does it cost and talk about food, that's completely unrealistic. And so the can-do statements help us to begin to bring realism to the, to the classroom in terms of speaking. The American Association of Teachers of Foreign Languages um, had developed proficiency guidelines for speaking, and they had 18 1986, 1990, 2001, 2012, and these guides were to describe what the proficiency would, would look like. And the only trouble with them is they were very wordy. If you look on the screen right now, look at all those words. And the trouble was if you tried to understand it, you weren't quite sure what was going on because there was too much talking, too many words on the page. And at the same time, the common European framework of reference for languages was being used. And as you know, Europe is a very small area. People go from easily from one country to another, and they did some way to measure whether they could speak the language or not. And so they came up with a criteria. And so what happened then is that the National Council of State Supervisors for Foreign Languages in the United States created something called the lingua folio. And that included part of the previous assessment. And then the American Association of Teachers of Foreign Language worked with them to actually develop these statements as a formal thing. And so you can search on the web and find it very easy by simply searching for ACTFL can do. And you can find these this 44 page document that details what it is like to be proficient in the language. And these can do statements include interpersonal communication, presentational speaking, writing, listening, and reading. So it's pretty comprehensive. And not only is it comprehensive going across with interpersonal communication, speaking, writing, listening, and reading, but it also covers various levels, the novice level, the lowest level, the intermediate level, the advanced level, the superior, and the distinguished. And for each one of those, there's a series of statements that identify what does it mean to listen at that level or to speak at that level. So it's a tremendous document. However, 
this is my reaction to the document. It's overwhelming. You can't implement all those things at once. So what most people do is they pick one area and they focus on that. And so I would suggest that one of the best ones to focus on is interpersonal communication. And we just look at that particular part of the can-do statements. And we focus on that because, as we know, in, in a modern language, being able to speak the language is really the critical part of it, um, considering that in our daily life, we listen and speak 70% of the time. So it would obviously it is important for us to be able to help them, students develop that. And I'm going to show you some examples of the statements. But I want to go over the basic levels, first of all. And just let me quick check, Sarah, um, where you are, are you using the CANDO statements or the CEFR, or are there any national standards you're using? Thank you very much, Sarah. OK. So the, this ASPO standard um, basically divides learning into the novice, intermediate, and middle level. So the novice, students can only communicate with a single memorized word. Do you have a brother? Yes. Do you eat pizza? No. Or they can begin at the novice mid to communicate on familiar topics using a variety of memorized words. Do you like? Do you like something? I like very short things. And it, it's sort of going from baby talk up to being able to say a little bit more. And it's not until they get to the very novice high where they can actually handle a, a small little conversation with simple questions, but it's still, again, it's still very memorized. And at the intermediate low, they can begin a very simple conversation. And notice at the intermediate mid, wow, they can use a series of sentences. That's a, a drastic improvement over what they've been doing. In intermediate high, they can do a conversation using various time frames and an unexpected complication. And by the way, it's most of our students in high in public school don't get to that level. And I'm actually going to show you a chart in just a little while about that. The novice level goes from talk, the students talking about themselves, the I, to talking about family and friends, and then they begin to communicate some things about community and city. So there's a very logical order for how they present this information. And the wonderful thing about the can-do statements is that these functions are universal. They apply to any language talk topic we can cover. Traditionally in a classroom, things are covered by topic, like house, family, uh, shopping. But what the can-do statements say is if we teach students, for example, to ask questions, they can ask questions about family, about um, places. So it's a uni it, it goes universally. That they can apply these to anything we teach them. And that's what makes them great functions. And the, most, the thing that has intrigued me about them is that as my students are beginning to finish the novice level, they're actually doing some things for the intermediate level. As you can see here, how interlooped they are. They're still doing the novice, but they're actually doing some of the intermediate things. And so each one of these is just looped. and keeps on looping to each other. So it's a very wonderful pattern to see students evolve and climb these ladders that are so connected together. The one thing that Axel has pointed out that is that students should be able to use language spontaneously. And even though they've memorized it, they should be able to let it come out anytime they need to, to communicate. And I love this picture of, of how spontaneous she is. And what it reminds us is that it's not traditionally where we cover chapter one, then we don't talk about that material anymore. Because in the can-do statements, the same functions of asking questions are repeated over and over again in different aspects. And so learning really is integrated throughout them. And here's some examples of some. Um, here's the, one of the novice mid-level. I can communicate on very familiar topics using a variety of words or phrases that I've practiced and memorized. So again, they can join us. Uh, they can talk using some words and phrases, but it has to be practiced and memorized. So they can introduce themselves. They can introduce themselves. Um, I can um, 
introduce myself and provide basic information. I can introduce someone else. I can respond to an introduction. Most of you are looking at it and going, oh, that's, that's probably what you do in your first uh, chapter. And it, it is very basic. And then if you look at the actual things, you can see the progression. It's very logical within those. And you notice these are stated in terms of what students can do. And that's a very important uh, thing about these can-do statements. Oops, sorry. I clicked one too many. Um, and I, let's see. Does this give me a back arrow? No. Um, Joe, can you help me go back one? I only have a forward arrow. Let me try. Thank you. Great. If you notice this in the United States, if a student has a language for 9, 10, 11, and 12, they begin to get to this intermediate level. So it really takes many years to arrive at that level in, in terms of it. It's not something we can say, well, our students are going to be proficient and they're going to be at the intermediate level right away. That's not true. It takes many years of working through these can-do statements for students to get there. And here's another statement of it, and this is again according to the United States, but Intermediate low, high school students after four years or college students after two semesters. So it really means our students, um, 9 to 12 are grade levels in the United States. So, and, and our school is obviously graduated after 12th grade. So, the, so if you notice this, it's saying this takes a long time for students to get through all of the novice material up to the intermediate level of speaking. And I don't know about the textbooks in Australia, but the textbooks in the United States are very vague. And the purpose of most courses are simply to cover the, the things. For example, my college textbook, I have to cover four, five chapters. That's the purpose of the course. There's really nothing else that's defined as to what the students have to learn. And that's a very vague purpose, as opposed to the these can-do statements that are practical, real-world skills. It says, what do the students have to be able to say? And so it's a drastic change in how we look at the course. Um, and so again, here's the actual proficiency guidelines, so wordy. And here's the can-do statement for the not, for example, this is not as high. Notice, I can ask and say a home address and email address. I can ask and say someone's nationality. I can ask and talk about family members and their characteristics. I can ask and talk about friends' family. And when it says talk about it, it says maybe saying maybe two other statements about the person. My, my brother's name is John. He is tall. He plays basketball. That would probably be enough at that level to do it. So notice how the students can look at this and know whether they can do it or not. And we can look at these and know whether students can do them or not because they're so precise. It really adds so much more accountability to the language classroom because of how precise these are. And I don't know if any of you have such precise skill definition in your school or not, um, but I, I don't think I've seen any, except for the, the European standards, that do this. So um, do either of you two have any of these type precise standards? Okay. Okay, okay, that's okay. So it's interesting because this is the first time I'm aware of an education, and <clears throat> I've been teaching since 1968. So um, I've been around for a few years, and I have never seen standards this precise, which makes it so wonderful because, in fact, I can then, it's easy to tell if students have achieved it or not. What these statements also mean is that the focus changes from what the teacher does in the classroom to what the students can do in the classroom. It changes to a performance-based classroom. The, um, what it focuses on is what the students can actually say in the classroom. So it's not on what we're teaching, but it's what they can say in the classroom. And the thing I like about the, the standards is that they really are a beacon to all of us. And I'm going to give you an example from the United States first. That in New York State, we have level, the, the state has come up with levels A, B, and C. And if you can imagine a student from New York moving down to Texas, walking up to his language teacher and saying, well, I'm at level A. 
And that teacher's going to look at him and say, what does level A mean? It, so there is no consistency. But if students begin, if teachers and students begin to use the can-do statements, then a student could go to Texas and say, I am at the novice mid-level. And the teacher there would understand that and know exactly where they are. So it's a very different way of thinking about that. And truthfully, uh, many nations in the world, in fact, the majority of them have accepted the NS, NCSSFL slash ACTFL guidelines as their language proficiencies. So this is really becoming the language standard for countries around the world. So it's intriguing to watch this and say and see that you could actually be talking with a teacher in another country like Bolivia and using the same terminology because the students are having to have, meet the same skill. And that's a phenomenal thing to happen. The wonderful thing about can-do statements is they transcend the textbook. And the purpose of a textbook becomes to support the can-do statements. Unfortunately, in the United States, many teachers feel that the textbook is what determines what's being taught in the classroom. And that should never be. The textbook should only guide the teacher in achieving his or her goals. And so the textbook should only be used for us in how it helps us to meet the can-do statements. And John Wooden, in this wonderful quote, makes us very aware that in the classroom, we cannot think that when students are doing, we, when students are doing something in the classroom, we have to ask whether this is an activity or whether they're learning something. And I've been into many language classrooms where teachers have spent half a period having students learn vocabulary words. They never use them in sentences. They're just learning the words which doesn't help with communication. They have to be able to use the words and sentences to be able to communicate. And so we have to say, what is our goal and how are we going to get there? The most, the thing about the ACTFL statements is it does not focus on vocabulary lists. There are no vocabulary lists. There are no grammar lists. In fact, there's no vocabulary proficiency. There is no grammar proficiency. There is simply speaking proficiency or writing or reading proficiency. So it's a very different way of thinking about it. The thing that some people have been surprised about with these actual statements is that every once in a while, they put something in another tense. And traditionally, the novice level is all present tense. So novice mid has a statement, I can make simple statements. And it says, I can tell where I went. And you instantly recognize that it's the past tense. But what actual has said is that all students have to do is use the most common verb in Spanish that would be flee. And they would just say flee and then where they're going or where they went to. So they're learning the I went as a vocabulary item, not a grammar item. So never are students being taught the congregate, conjugation here. They're just being taught how to quickly say this as a grammar point. And it, when teachers teach some of the grammar points as vocabulary, it makes it so much easier for students to learn it. So again, the whole thing is students being able to communicate with other people. And that's the power of this. Um, and I want to look at this, and we're going to talk in a second about the whole level. The novice low, for example, says I can communicate on very familiar topics using single words or phrases. I can greet my peers by saying hello and goodbye. I can introduce myself to someone. Um, I can tell someone, someone my name. I can answer yes, no, either, or, who, what, when, and where questions. And so that's part of one of the activities. And I wanted to show you that in detail because if you notice there's three major categories under here, and then the third category actually has a few other sub-items underneath it. And so what that really amounts to is that in the novice level, there are five statements at the novice low level, 25 at the novice mid, 17 at the novice high. There is a total of 47 statements that students can be held accountable for and that help us to measure how the students have achieved in going through these. Um, and, and so that may sound like a huge number, but they've broken it down. And that's what makes it nice is that you can measure things at increments instead of saying, oh, it's the end of the year. Now you can speak. So it really helps students to have that focus. And the teachers I've been talking to that are using these can-do statements they're actually setting goals for the whole class, saying, for example, by the end of this year, 
I want us to be 85% done with, to be able to do 85% of the novice mid by the end of the year. And that's what the teacher's goal is for that classroom. So the students will be able to speak at the novice mid level by the end of the year. And notice what a different goal that is than saying by the end of the year we will have covered five chapters. So this is a very precise measure of how students can do it. And truthfully, if you set a goal for yourself and the students, the students love that little competitive edge. Um, when I was doing this, it was so funny last semester because my students would say, how close are we to reaching the end? Can we, can I get these all done? And it sort of became this interesting competition to see if we could get them all done, not in the sense of coverage, but in the sense of can I do all these skills? So I would like to, you to think about if, you know, setting a goal once you look at these documents. The other thing um, that this, these can-do statements are really in their infancy and they're beginning to be used by more and more schools. Um, I did a presentation this morning and there were two school districts that are using them. It is their new syllabus in languages. So more and more schools are using these full time. So one of the ways that I use these is I remember I would have students come in, you know, during the first week of class from some other school or some other state, and you try to figure out whether they really belong in your class or not. And one of the ways I now do it at the college level is I actually give them these can-do statements, and I give them five to ten minutes to check them off. Which one of these can you do? And I tell my students that uh, at the college level in my beginning Spanish course that by the end of the semester I hope to have most of novice level done. And I actually had one student who marked everything off and says, I don't belong in this course because I can already do it. And isn't that so great that students can assess where they are and it helps us a great deal to really place students where they belong and to help them um, to do that with. And I want to show you this because this is an actual graph of my students and this was done the very first day of class. And if you notice the two items are that they can say their name, which is um, novice level W1 and um, novice mid 2. So that's what most of my students come in to do. They can say their name in Spanish. But notice, they really couldn't function on the can-do statements at all. And so I had that available so that we could do that. I also have now been trying to rework all of my tests so that they actually measure the can-do statements. As we mentioned, one of the first things they're supposed to do according to can-do statements is say their name. So in the target language, I would have the question, what is your name, and have some choices. And they can do it. So I can actually quiz the can-do statements. And it's a real, it, it gives me a concrete basis for knowing I'm testing something worthwhile to do that with. Um, and this is, if you look at this, you can see that it's a checkoff sheet. And I actually give my students this after every unit we cover. And they check off the new skills that they can do. And I have to tell you the excitement that they have when they see that they can have increased in their speaking skill is amazing. I know of no other time in education in a modern language class where students have ever known how well they speak in class. And here they can constantly tell, oh, I can do this now, I can do this now, I can do this now. And there's a beautiful sense of achievement and it motivates them to want to learn more. Um, and this semester, I was so impressed, I was trying a slightly different method than usual, and my students, you know, afterwards they said to me, but we can do almost all of those now. And, and they said, not fully, but we, we can, we're coming close to being able to do them. And I thought, what a great statement for them to feel. They become so confident in their language. And that's something that, as we know, if students aren't confident, then they don't want to do things in their language. So this is a great tool for them to self-check. And then I usually listen in on conversations so I can check and see whether that's actually true, but most students are very true about that. It also means now when I think about my, the lessons I teach, I say to myself, what can do proficiency am I, am I being going to achieve as a result of this lesson? And if they don't achieve that, then I really haven't done anything worthwhile in that class. And so I really focus very much on what can do proficiency will students achieve as a result of this lesson. It doesn't matter how wonderful the lesson is, if the students can't do one of the proficiencies, then I really haven't done a very good job at teaching. And so it gives me a whole different focus each day when I think of my lesson plan. 
one of the, the problems becomes if you try to do this using a textbook, if I look at the novice mid, I can answer a variety of questions. Oops, I misspelled textbook. Sorry about that. Where in the, and, and I want to find this in my textbook. The first thing I can answer questions about what I like and dislike shows up in chapter 4.1. The next one I can answer questions about what I'm doing and what I did shows up in chapter 7.2. The next one where I'm going and where I went shows up in chapter 7.2. And the last one, questions about something I have learned shows up in chapter 11.1. That's really confusing to jump from chapter to chapter to try to cover a particular uh, can-do statement. Like, I can answer a variety of questions. And by the way, in my first year course, we only go up to chapter five. So my students wouldn't be able to do this. So our books in the United States, anyway, are not proficiency-based. Uh, they're standard traditional grammar textbooks. They look a lot fancier, but they're still grammar textbooks. And that's their major focus. So. I want to repeat that these can-do language functions, they have to become a major focus of what we do. They cannot be as one, one textbook company was showing me how their book was can-do ready because they had one line in each chapter that talked about the can-do statement. It has to be a major activity. It can't just be a one-line sentence. It has to be the major focus of what's happening in that chapter so students can actually learn how to do it. And one of the things that's happened um, is that if you say students will reach novice mid by the end of the year, that means all of your tests have to only measure novice mid. And that means that tests that measure past tense verbs, speaking of the time frames, you cannot be tested because it's only at the intermediate high level that students can do that. And yet, I'm sure many of you are aware that we begin testing past tense verbs very early in Spanish, in, in language courses, when students aren't there in terms of how they can communicate. And so we have, it shows us the inconsistency in some of our testing that we're doing and helps us to be very aware that, in fact, when we're uh, having the students reach novice mid, that we can only test in the present tense because that's the level they're supposed to be speaking at. We cannot have them do things in, in another tense. And it helps us to have tests that really measure what students are learning and that aren't just torture tests. Um, there are three basic approaches that people are using. And I want to talk about the first two and then the third one in detail. The first way, as I mentioned, is you can look in your textbook and find out what chapter all this appears in. Um, and that you know, is very hard to do because it may be in many different chapters. A second method is you can say, well, in chapter one of my textbook, I'm going to do novice low. And in chapter two, I'm going to do whatever. And that really is hard because you're forcing down the textbook. And most people I know that are doing these can-do statements are actually getting rid of the textbook and having the can-do statements become their syllabus. And they are building things around the can-do statements. And I just talked with some people this morning, and they are very excited about this because they feel like what they're teaching the students now is worthwhile because it helps to lead them towards the can-do statements. So that's an exciting way to think about these in terms of that. And, and it's going to have to be your choice how you work. And that you know, the third approach, developing your own syllabus for this, is a much more solid academic way to do it than trying to use the textbook to do it, at least in the, United, the textbooks we have in, in the United States, which are, like I said, very grammar-based. And I would like to show you these were my results in a college course where I spent a great deal of time having students meet these. And if you look, you can see that even with all of this in, in a college course where we're supposed to be doing two years worth of Spanish in one semester, um, I got my students fairly high, but there still are major gaps in my students. So my students did not reach the novice high level by the end of the semester. And so I think looking at your courses and realistically saying, how high do we do we think our students can reach? Novice mid, which aspect of novice mid do we think they can reach by the end of this course? And then focus on that and make sure the activities you do in class lead towards that. And I would like to suggest immersing your students in the language just so they get to hear the language. Because the more language they hear, the better they're going to get. There's obviously TPRS, 
um, which is our storytelling via that method. Um, there's AIM, which is a, a method now being uh, popular from Canada, which is a accelerated integrated method, which is where students spend time learning a play and the vocabulary is repeated over and over again. Um, and there's a gesture method. The more time we spend in English in the modern language classroom, the more we deprive students of a modern language education. Because in fact, it's the only time they're going to hear the language. So we have to use every moment of that class to give students as much language as possible. And that's really a critical factor in our students being able to be successful. And one of the things that Axel has said is that students should be hearing language that's above the level they're at. They should be hearing real life language in the classroom instead of, I thought, sixth grade um, for a long time. And I developed what I call baby Spanish. And looking back, it was a horrible mistake because I deprived my students of the opportunity to hear real Spanish. And one of the things you want to, you might want to think about as you're doing this, is what percentage of each section do you feel you need for the students to be successful? As I mentioned, in some of the subsections, there's four or five items. Do you feel the students have to do every single item to be successful, or 80% of it each section? Um, and in my case, my students did not do the past tense. There was a past tense statement, there was a present perfect statement, and there was a future statement. And my students did not do those. Um, so they weren't successful in, theirs, in those areas. Um, so it's up to you to determine what would make success. And then students can see that success. And then what I do is I actually give my students a certificate. Um, and what I do is every time they meet the novice low, I give them a certificate. Or with the intermediate, every time they meet, there's, uh, I think, eight subsections. Every time they do a subsection, I give them a certificate. And most of my students tell me this is the only time, and many of my students have already taken Spanish in high school, that they on, this is the only time they've ever had anyone tell them how successful they've been in their language in speaking. And imagine the morale boost for the students to get these certificates as they've gone through it. And that what happens is they get these and they're so proud of them. They put them on the fridge, they put them on their notebooks, they, show, they say, look at what I can do in the language. And that success is such a wonderful thing. Um, I know some people are into digital badges that are being used now. And I've done digital badges with my students as a, and all, in addition to paper. And so this is what digital badges might look like if you're a person that likes to use um, that. And I think you know it's really interesting for you to think about is what interpersonal communication can do statements can your students do now. And by looking at the actual statement, just sit to that list and assess, what can they do right now? And then more importantly, what can your students do by the end of the course? And how can you help them to get that, get them there? And it's really a powerful thing when your students, you set a goal for the class that they're going to reach, you know, novice, uh, novice mid by the end of the year, and they reach it. They are so excited because they can have so much success during the year. I'm going to do a quick... Uh, little brag session for a couple minutes. I'm going to open up for questions. I do have a book called Modern Language Proficiencies, Can-Do Strategies. That's a ebook or PDF um, that goes through and develops activities for each of these. Um, I do have lots of lang language activities online that help students at fair beginning level to do lots of speaking, um, which is basically my focus. Um, I do have a book on using mobile learning in the classroom. And most of the book is about using speaking, using mobile activities in the classroom. And students like that because they love using their mobile device in the classroom as a basis for their talking. Um, and I do have a book, Improving Foreign Language Speaking Through Formative Assessment. And there's my contact information. So questions, please. Um, I'm teaching a college course. So my college course goes from uh, January through May. So it's a one semester college course, a, a three credit hour during course. And you know, like I said, I was talking to people this morning, they're doing this in, in high school. Okay, other questions, please. Um, 
Um, how many states are using this? I would say that that's an awkward question. I know people in all states are using them. Has the state officially adopted them? Most states have um, had this as that. We have the problem in the United States that each state came up with their own criteria, and some states are still hanging on to them, but most states are beginning to accept this as the state national standard for languages. And a quick comment about that, and, and I've mentioned this before, but it just it causes a whole different change in mentality when we know that we have specified what levels of speaking we want students to be at, and we can help students get to those levels. And it's a very different focus than I'm going to teach them to speak whatever that means in the language. And I think that's been the problem with language courses in the past, is we've never been able to specify what we mean by speaking proficiency. Um, if people want to, if you email me, uh, find that screen and we can look at it, um, I can email you back. I have reduced the standards to one page, one side of the page is all the novice and the other side is all the intermediate. And it's that checkoff list I've talked about and I'd be happy to send it to you if you'd like. So just, um, if you, oh. If you just email me and, and simply put in the, uh, please put in your message, can do, so I know what you're looking for, and I would be happy to uh, send them to you so you can have this convenient. I, I've taken the actual checklist, which goes on for many pages, and turned it into a real checklist, and it's very convenient, and I'm happy to share that. Thank you very much indeed. That, that sounds like something that you know, would be very, very useful indeed. Um, just a reminder that if people want to uh, save all the whiteboards uh, from this session, they can go to File and then Save and then Whiteboard and save it as a PDF file. Um, and I've just done that because uh, there's a lot here that I would like to go back and um, reread and um, listen to again. Thank you very much indeed, um, Harry. It's been really excellent and really interesting. Okay. And, uh, I'd like to give and you a you round of applause in the virtual <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if anybody has any questions about these leads, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to ask questions about them. Such a question about them. Sarah's about to head off to Taiwan oh, to wow. teach English to grade five students. Sarah, I would if if you haven't looked at the AIMS program, the accelerated integrated program a method, it's a, a gesturing method. It's really great for getting a lot of comprehensive input to students. So um, you know, if you might want to look into that, I think they need to change some of the output on the system, but I, I like some good things. Okay. So have a great time everybody then. Okay, now the, the next, um, the links for the next one uh, is either um, this one or there's another one. Um, we, uh, where is it? Here we go. Those are, those are the two sessions which will be coming next, um, if you would like to go on to any of those. And there we go, Sarah is giving you a round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Harry, I'll close off the recording now. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your help. <laughs>